Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Spokane City Council Legislative Agenda for October 17th. If you'd please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Here. <laughs> oh, was that? <laughs> and Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Council President Banks. Here. Council Member Bingle. Here. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Kinnear. Present. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Here. Council Member Sapone. Here. Let the record reflect that all council members are present. All right. And thanks to Spokane Arts, we have some more poetry at the podium tonight. And Gregory Davis is going to read. Uh, Trentwood, CA 1965. Come right up to the podium there and speak right into that mic would be great. Gregory Davis, my poem is titled Trentwood 1965. Six mental snapshots from the mind of a 12-year-old. Big K grocery. Shasta soda, eight cents a can. Where you could watch a red-nosed man turn 400 empty beer bottles, penny a piece, enough for him to buy 24 full ones. Thrift store. A Miles frozen walk, dad and I fetching home 10 Presto logs so we could survive another zero degree night. Kaiser Aluminum, Ravening Hulk, squatting south of Trent Avenue, swallowed dad for 40 years, cut him loose with an arthritic knee. Blessings Tavern, long low dive, steel workers separated from their paychecks an ocean, a 3% lager, the social lube. Breezy's Barbershop, old men with bad coughs, spitting and chewing, cussing new words into my adolescent ears while I got my boot camp style crew cut. Trentwood, circa 1965, kids played on the mean streets, grown ups played for N prayed for ends to meet. Some called the place a slum. It was for some. Thank you so much, Mr. Davis. <laughs> and we have a lot of people here for a proclamation that Councilmember <laughs> Kinnear is going to read, Hindu American Heritage and Appreciation Month. Thank you. And I'm going to read this, and then I'd like to have um, whoever wishes to speak, come up and say a few words, and then I will come down and present to you. Whereas the Spokane community is positively influenced by the extraordinary cultural, ethnic, linguistic, and religious diversity of its residents, and whereas Hindu Americans share the entrepreneurial spirit of America and contribute to Spokane's economic vitality, growth, and well-being, and whereas Hindu temples, organizations, and individuals engage in a siva, a Sanskrit word for selfless service through charity and public service, and whereas ahimsa, Sanskrit for non-injury or non-violence, is a central Hindu-American principle and the ethical foundation for vegetarianism, environmentalism, and harmonious living, and whereas despite their positive contributions to Spokane, Washington State, and the nation, Hindu Americans face stereotypes and misconceptions about their heritage and have been the targets of bullying, discrimination, hate speech, and bias-motivated crimes. And whereas Hindu phobia defined as a set of antagonistic, destructive, and derogatory attitudes and behaviors towards Sanatana Dharma, Hinduism and Hindus that may manifest as prejudice, fear, or hatred is also increasing in the US in parallel with the rise of anti-Hindu hate crimes. 
And whereas Hindu Americans promote the ideals of tolerance, pluralism, and religious freedom, which are inherent to their beliefs and respect the diversity of all faiths, and whereas Hindu temples, organizations, and individuals provide platforms for cultural exchange through art, music, and celebration of festivals, which are open to all and believe that the whole world is one big family, the underlying principle from the Vedas, the ancient text of Hindu Americans. Now, therefore, Brian Beggs, Spokane City Council President, on behalf of the community members of Spokane, do hereby proclaim October 2022 as Hindu American Heritage and Appreciation Month. So thank you. Can, can you come up? Welcome. Yes, you may, may speak. Thank you for being thank here. Thank you. I, Himani Agrawal, on behalf of Hindu community and Spokane Hindu temple, accept this proclamation and thank Mayor Ms. Nadine Woodward, City Council President Mr. Beggs, City Councilor Member Laurie Kinner, and all council members and city staff for declaring October as Hindu American Heritage and Appreciation Month. I also thank HAF for initiating this process. Over the past few years, there has been significant growth of Hindu Americans in the region, and we have contributed to this vibrant and diverse spoken city in various capacities. Our faith is often misunderstood and leads to Hindu phobia. This recognition will help to increase awareness and educate fellow Americans about our culture and traditions. This pro proclamation brings us immense pride and gratitude. We look forward to work with City Council on different community initiatives. We invite all of you for the celebration of Diwali, a major Hindu festival, this Saturday, October 22nd, at Riverfront Square. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Yes. Can we help take pictures? Are we all taking pictures? Yeah. No, we'll just, I'll just if anybody wants me to grab their cameras. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> All right, I'd next like to invite up Major Ken Perrine from the Salvation Army to give us an administrative report. Salvation Army is one of our partners who are working with people to transition out of homelessness into housing and community connection. Welcome, Major. Thank you, Council President Beggs and Council Members. Uh, first off, just want to acknowledge that Hamani is my neighbor and they're wonderful people. So uh, <laughs> literally right next door. So, so great. But I, I do want to talk about the, the way out. We've been in operation for 10 months. And in that time, we've had, just want to throw some numbers out first. 248 people have come through and uh, 207 have been discharged. 12 permanent subsidized, unsubsidized housing. 22 unsubsidized uh, transitional housing. Uh, Oxford House is 13. Uh, three to a motel. Three went to jail in order to work on their issues. They had uh, wants and warrants they had to work out before they can, we can help them. Um, sadly, two died. Uh, four purchased a trailer. Five went to assisted living. Uh, 23 were actually reunited with family members that, uh, guaranteed, that uh, agreed to help them move forward in their lives. Uh, 10 went to inpatient treatment. And 110 went back to homelessness. But here's the kind of cool thing about this. In fact, some of the people that I think are standing now uh, they should be. Uh, sometimes they come in and then they go out and then they come back in and then they go out and then they come back in and they move forward. So if, even for the ones that want to return to homelessness, they're going to be back. 
they're going to be back because they'll tell you the same thing, that we, we love people where they're at and help them move forward. Some positive things, other positive things, uh, places where our guests are currently hired or um, are, are currently working. So we have uh, five at Sweeto Burrito off division. So if you go over there, there's a good chance you're going to be served by one of our current guests or former guests. Um, three work at Heavenly Teas up the street. Uh, three work at Dollar Tree. Um, one works at Delish, which is pretty amazing because remember he was quite against us even opening. That's so uh, <laughs> City of Spokane, you've hired three. They're working for you right now, Parks and Rec. Two work for Durham School Services, uh, three at Pioneer uh, Human Services. Um, pe uh, people Ready, they work at 12 over there. Jack and the Boss, three. Frontier Behavioral Health, one. And though we have another one about to be hired. Uh, New Leaf Cafe Training Program, we have three. Uh, Roadmaps to Success Training Program, we have five. Uh, three have opened their own business. And so just some positive things to share with you. Just for the folks that are here, they're gonna wave when I uh, mention their name. Kevin has an apartment and uh, he gets it on Thursday. A first contact was two years ago and first time sober uh, was 62 days ago. So okay. Rob. <laughs> Rob just arrived four days ago from the Trent shelter, but uh, we have great and high aspirations for him. Eric is now a private contractor. He owns his own construction business, and uh, he's going to school on computer programming. Um, Cassandra just got housing starting next week. She's employed with Pioneer Human Services. And uh, Mickey is participating in Roadmaps to Success, the job training program. I'm just so excited about uh, what's been going on. Uh, you know, we're just, we don't want to house people. We've said this before. We don't want to house people for the sake of housing them. We want to help them actually move forward to be successful citizens in our great community. The Salvation Army, we're about rescue the perishing, renew the ability to thrive and restore a healthy community. And even them being here today is part of that learning to be part of our great Spokane community. Thank you again for the funding that you provide to us and for your, your support. Thanks for the support. And thanks, you guys, for coming down and Thank being you. here. Yeah. Okay, that gets us to the consent agenda. Before we do the consent agenda, I'm looking for a motion to add the latest version of the revived contract. Oh, I have a different motion. Okay. So moved. Okay, second. All right. Uh, and just by way of brief discussion on that, we, um, Jen Saracides, scrambled around and got that done and just a few minutes before we started, got the last blank uh, there. We do have some revived people. If you're here, revive. You can there. They're ready to go. They're like ready to go last week. Uh, they want to get, get working, get people moving ahead, just like the major said. Um, so anyway, that's just, oh, anyway, the motion is to um, add that contract to the OPR. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? Okay, that's added. Now Council let President. CHHS enter in that. So we're gonna, yours is right after the consent. I have a, I have one oh, you for have a consent. consent one too. Yeah, okay, can we sorry. just take number one separately? Yes, we can. And, and then when we go to vote on the whole consent agenda. Yes. I just wanna say a few words regarding number six. Okay. Okay. I will do that. Okay. And so, Councilmember Cathcart, just to be clear on one, the, the setting of the public hearing, that's what you wanna do separately. Yeah. Okay. All right. Council President, we do have one appointment. Do you want to do that one first? It's to the ombudsman. Sure. Okay. Well, let's, did we, we added, we did the amendment. Yes, go ahead and do the appointment, okay. yes. James Wilburn, Jr., reappointment to the Office of Police, Police Ombudsman Commission from October 3, 2022 to October 3, 2025. All right. All those in favor of the reappointment, okay, by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Any abstentions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Wilburn, for your service. And for those of you who are interested in serving on a commission or a board, uh, the My Spokane website has a page of board and commissions. It tells what they do. It says what openings we're currently looking for, what the terms are of people who might be uh, finishing up their term. And for almost all of them, you apply with the mayor's office. And the mayor uh, nominates people and sends them to us for confirmation. So check it out if you're interested. All right, now we're at the consent agenda. We're gonna take number one separately, and then once it's read, 
I'll let Council Member Stratton talk about number six, and there's no public comment requested. Okay. Reports, contracts, and claims. Number one will be taken separately. Number two, setting hearings for review of the 2023 proposed budget beginning November 7, 2022, and continuing thereafter at the regular council meetings through December 5, 2022. Number three, setting hearing for the Citywide Capital Improvement Program 2023 to 2028 on November 14, 2022. Number four, value blanket amendment with Hitachi Zosen and Nova USA LLC, Norcross, Georgia, for the purchase of feeder and great parts at the Waste Energy Facility from July 1, 2021 through June 30, 2023, $800,000. Total cost, $1,400,000 plus tax. Item number five is deferred to October 24, no, we, 2022 we agenda. That. Item number six, contract with Integris that. Architecture to conduct an in-depth district-wide and regional examination of um, Spokane Fire Department's immediate short-term and long-term capital facility needs, $436,938. Item number seven, one-year renewal of Starplex Master Security Service contract to provide security services at various city of Spokane locations on an as-needed basis for various city departments, $736,000. Number eight, interlocal agreement between Spokane Police Department and Spokane County Sheriff's Office for use of a law enforcement vehicle dedicated to the transport of persons unable to be transported in a traditional vehicle. Number nine, report of the mayor of pending claims and payments of previously approved obligations, including those of parks and library through October 7, 2022. Total $14,780,771.19 with parks and library claims approved by the respective boards. Warrants excluding parks and library total $13,945,033.61. Number 10, city council meeting minutes for October 3 and October 13, 2022. Item number 11, Washington State Department of Transportation agreement. GCB 3767 public agency participating agreement for construction of city funded traffic calming improvements along Ralph Street as part of the WASDOT North South Corridor construction $151,499.94. Number 12 contract with Revive Counseling Spokane LLCP Spokane to provide services to individuals staying at the Trent Resource and Assistance Center $1,570,211. And Madam Clerk, just to clarify, I think number five you said was deferred for one week, right? We're, Correct. Yeah, okay. Councilmember Sorry, Bingham. I just heard some people in the audience or saw some people doing this. I don't know if they can hear in, in our current auditorium right here. Okay, you're not hearing? Mm -hmm. Can you hear now? That's, right. It's funny, they gave us a warning earlier before we got here. They said, if you're anywhere close to your microphone, even when the meeting's over and things, everybody's going to hear it. That's right. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll try to speak up, but thanks for the input. And go ahead and do what you did before. If you can't hear us, we, we want you to be able to hear us if you're going to be here. Thanks. Uh, all right, Council Member Stratton, you wanted to address item number six. Yes, um, I plan to support everything on the consent agenda tonight. But I do want to make a comment um, regarding item number six, which is a contract with Integris Architecture to study sites for Spokane Fire Department facilities. And the cost is $436,000. I just want to go on the public record to make sure that when we say we will be looking at the entire district and region to figure out where best to site our long and short term facilities that the consultants truly solicit the, pers the perspectives, truly solicit the perspectives and expertise of the citizens within and along our city borders and the leadership of our regional fire service partners. We share borders with multiple fire districts and we already utilize automatic and aid agreements to provide the fastest and most efficient fire and medical service for all city and county residents. Because one of the things that these consultants will be determining is where we may choose to site future fire stations in underserved areas of our city, let's be sure that the chief, the staff, and other stakeholders along, with those, along those borders are at the table. There may be mutual benefits to collaborate with other fire agencies who already have some infrastructure and staffing in the area. Thank you. Yeah, and just, just to follow up, that's well said, but this contract came out of, we were just gonna do a smaller contract with just one fire district mm -hmm. on five miles. So this is 
going to include that and the whole region. Perfect. So. All right. Uh, all those in favor of the consent agenda as read, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Any abstentions? All right. Then now we're going to take matter number one separately. Item number one, setting public hearing on possible revenue sources for the 2023 budget on October 24, 2022. All right. Uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Nay. There's two nays. Any abstentions? Okay. So that passes five to two. All right. And then now, Councilmember Cathcart. I think you had another motion. Yeah, I, I move that we defer for one week, uh, well, to our next meeting, ordinance uh, C36282 and ordinance C36284. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right, any discussion? I, sorry, um, <clears throat> what's, what's the purpose of deferring it for a week? Um, well, specifically on 36282, uh, for, for me, I, I want to separate out the retainage from the vehicles uh, so that we can make a separate decisions on those. And they're just so intertwined, we need some time to pull those apart. Um, and then um, criminal justice assistance fund, I, I, I'm just supportive of a little bit more time to think through how that's going to work. Thank you. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? <clears throat> All right. Oh, any abstentions? Okay. That's deferred and nobody signed up to speak on those either. Onward, another special budget ordinance. Ordinance C36294, amending ordinance number C36161 passed by the City Council December 13, 2021 and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2022 making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year in December 31, 2022, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage, and declared an emergency and appropriating funds in. General Fund decreased the appropriation for a community court coordinator in the Municipal Court Department by $71,300. Number two, increased the appropriation for registration schooling by $5,000. Number three, increased the appropriation for professional services by $55,000. Number four, increased the appropriation for advertising by $2,200. Number five, increased the appropriation for office supplies by $1,100. Number six, increased the appropriation for operating supplies by $8,000. A, there is no change to the overall appropriation level in the general fund. This action arises from the need to appropriately fund the court's therapeutic court program as provided in SMC 5, 5A.18.030. There's no public comment. Any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. Okay, that passes six to one. Ordinance C36295, general fund number one, increase the appropriation in ammunition by $200,000. A of the increased appropriation, $200,000, is to be used solely for the procurement of 2023 department ammunition. B, this is an increase to the overall appropriation level in the general fund and will be funded by general fund unappropriated reserves. This section arising from the need to order next year ammunition now in order to avoid significant price increases. Again, no public comment. Any council commentary? All right, prepare to vote. All right, seven to zero. Ordinance C36302, Criminal Justice Assistance Fund, number one, increase appropriation by $1,570,211. A, of the increased appropriation, $1,570,211 is provided solely as a transfer out to the Community Housing and Human Services Administration. And I apologize, I need to read this one in full, so I'm going to start over. <laughs> Sorry about that. Ordinance number C36302, an ordinance amending ordinance number C36161 passed by the City Council December 13, 2021 and entitled, 
an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2022, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2022, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declaring an emergency. Whereas subsequent to the adoption of the 2022 budget ordinance number C36161 is above entitled, and which passed the City Council December 13, 2021, it is necessary to make changes in the appropriations of the Criminal Justice Assistance Fund and the Community Housing and Human Services Administration Fund, which changes could not have been anticipated or known at the time of making such budget ordinance. And whereas this ordinance has been on file in the City Clerk's Office for five days, now therefore the City of Spokane does ordain. Section one, that in the budget of the Criminal Justice Assistance Fund and the budget, budget annexed thereto with reference to the fund, the following changes be made. Number one, increase appropriation by $1,570,211. A of the increased appropriations, $1,570,211 is provided solely as a transfer out to the Community Housing and Human Services Administration Department. Section two, that in the budget of the Community Housing and Human Services Administration Fund and the budget annexed thereto with reference to the fund, the following changes be made. Number one, increased revenue by $1,570,211. A of the increased revenue, $1,570,211 is provided solely as a transfer out of the Criminal Justice Assistance Fund. Number two, increase appropriation by $1,570,211. A of the increased appropriation, $1,570,211 is provided solely for contractual services for the Trent Resource and Administration Center. Section three, it is therefore by the City Council declared that an urgency and emergency exists for making the changes set forth herein. Such urgency and emergency arising from the need to fund the wraparound services for the residents of the Trent Resource and Administration Center and because of such need and urgency and emergency exists for the passage of this ordinance. And also because the same makes an appropriation, it shall take effect and be enforced immediately upon its passage. There's no community commentary requested. Any other council commentary? Uh, I haven't I haven't seen any yet, but did we get clarification on whether or not we could use money from this fund for that? We I talked to city attorney afterwards. He wasn't aware of anything. We did get an email from Tanya Wallace. Mm -hmm. I sent her back a clarifying question. I haven't heard back from her yet. Okay. Um, the money's not going to get spent for a while, so I think there's time to work on it. Yeah, I guess that was that's my only my only question is obviously that um, track without any of the services obviously is incomplete. You know the whole package required the services, and so I, I want it to go forward. I just want to make sure that we're using it from the right fund. And so if we've got time to correct that later, then so. great. I have a question for the services. Service. You did? Yes. You did, and I am so sorry, James. Come on, come on down. And thanks for letting me know. Yes. Yeah. Understood. Greatly appreciate the understanding. Yeah. Um, so this contract, if I recall, was supposed to be for double, but it's not. Instead, it's for half. So I'll say this: Are you willing to walk through those doors tomorrow, City of Spokane? Willing to do your job for half cost? We know you can do it, but are you willing to? Because you're. It's supposed to be at three mil, more services, but instead it got cut in half. I'm going to say half quite a bit because what you're fostering now is a, I'm not getting paid enough or short staffed. <laughs> it's not my job. That's what you're fostering with this. So you're fostering with that mentality. And if you want effective, that's A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E -E and E-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E -E. um, workers and everything, you got to pay them well. So please. Consider adding more to the track shelter so that way the people working there can live a life. They're not going to, and they won't be short staffed because everybody's saying they're short staffed. CS Bookend, how short staffed are you right now? If you're feeling it too, well, guess what? You just kind of created that over there by them, by cut in half. So I'll end with this. If you're not willing, to do your job at half cost tomorrow, don't show up until you add more money to that track shelter so that way the people working there can live a life. Thank you. Thanks for coming down, James. 
I, well, I, I was going to say one clarification for you. You might still have the same comment. Yeah. But James, I was just going to let you know that um, the way the contract's working, nobody working for Revive is going to be working for half. It's a question of how many people can they hire to work for what they're paying them. And it's going to take them a bit of time to ramp up. Mm -hmm. And I'm, what I'm really hoping is that as they demonstrate great results, which I know they will, uh, then we'll be able to go to the state and other places and get more money for that. Because you are exactly right. If we're not fully funding services, you know, what are we doing? So I'm, I'm with you, but I think it's, they're not going to ask anyone to work for half, just so you know. But. I, I was going to comment, and, and thank you for those comments for right on the button. Uh, just has been a challenge to actually get a contract to do the work. And when it was budgeted for these wraparound services, it was budgeted for right around a million dollars because we didn't know really what those services were gonna look like. And then when the proposal came back at $3 million, which we are struggling to find 1.5 tonight, not that we don't wanna fund it, but if there is no money, we can't pay what we don't have. Um, but as council president said, we will be looking going forward and we are hoping for success beyond our dreams uh, with the wraparound services out there at the Trent shelter. Yeah, uh, more along the, the same lines. Um, again, as Councilwoman Wilkerson just said, this is 50% more than what we thought the cost was gonna be. And so it's not a lack of willingness to invest um, in either this shelter or, or any of the others. Um, this, this council is actively trying to find dollars to be able to invest in people who are, uh, um, who are in need. And so it's, it's not any lack of desire to help people. Uh, when we talk about being short staffed, 300 positions at the city we're down right now um, that, aren't, that aren't filled. Um, you know, and, I mean, we're talking tens of millions of dollars this, this council is allocating to this, to this issue. So there's not any lack of investment into people or into the people doing the work uh, because we understand it requires a, um, a specialty uh, to be able to do it effectively. And so um, I'm sure if the Revive people were still here, they were here earlier, but I'm sure that they would tell you that um, that a billion and a half is a lot of money. And while it's not the, the full uh, you know, bid that they gave us, there's, there's no lack of investment or want to invest more um, in that community from this council, so. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I would just say <clears throat> we're, we're, as has been kind of affirmed a few times here tonight, you know, we're in a really tight budget situation. Um, and I've struggled on this a lot. And in fact, you know, I voted against the operating agreement because we could not identify where the funds were gonna come from. Um, and the, we have some really tough choices to make. I will say I'm, you know, also a realist. And I understand that if we don't have the service component, essentially what we've stood up is a warehouse. And that is no good to anybody. And frankly, it's never gonna allow us to ramp down which is our ultimate goal. So I will support this tonight, and we will just make sure that we can cover the costs and figure out you know, where all those priorities are to make sure that we have the funding available for this. All right, prepare to vote. All right, seven to zero. Resolution 2022-94, laying out City Council's priorities as related to the City of Spokane's annual budget for 2023. All right, Council Member Wilkerson and Council Member Cathcart and myself serve on the City Council Budget Work Group, and we um, got the Mayor's preliminary budget the, a couple weeks ago. And essentially, this is our response because uh, the mayor will be presenting us with a final proposed budget, which we will then uh, amend. But in order to try to close the gap before that presentation is made, uh, council members have been discussing, all of the council members, uh, what are a few principles that we'd like to see in that. And so that's really what this resolution is. Uh, it will kick off further negotiations with the administration every year for as long as I've been on council. We, we have a deficit when it starts and we have a gap between how the mayor and the council and we always figure out how to get a balanced budget and close that gap so this is part of it but our what we heard last year from the mayor's office was that because we hadn't done a resolution they didn't think we were clear enough in what we were looking for so that's what we're doing this year 
and we have a few things if you haven't read it, but one is not to use American Rescue Plan Act in the budget. Those are one-time funds, so it shouldn't be part of the operations. Uh, two, we're looking to uh, target of a 10% reduction in general fund expenses. Uh, and three, uh, what we really want to get clear on, one of the things that really uh, broke our budget in this last year was public safety capital, fire trucks and police cars. And we want to hear what, what the administration wants to spend on that next year uh, while we do the budget instead of after we pass the budget with special budget ordinances. We've also requested that um, we revive the public safety vehicle plan, long-term plan. We had a really good plan we were working on. We were adding money every year to it, real dollars, and we were using loans earlier, and then we were going to pay off those loans, really, in the next couple of years. We were supposed to have no more loans on that and plenty of money for vehicles, and this administration kind of went away from that during the COVID crisis, um, and, you know, council approved those budgets, so we were part of that, but we're really asking that we get the long-term plan. Um, also, that we, if we use ARPA money for revenue replacement, that we tie them to actual cuts and position expenses for 2023. So we can use that one-time money to get permanent savings. Um, and again, we're talking, when we talk about cuts and positions, we're looking at our first place is we're looking at all the vacant positions we have. And then the last is that when we do um, have what we call contra account or we're freezing a position, that it be, um, that we formalize that so it doesn't just come back later as we've been getting all these special budget ordinances saying, well, we didn't fill that position, so now we want to spend money on trucks and other, other things. So we're saying, let's, let's not do that. Uh, and then the last two goals are to um, set, to continue to work towards reestablishing our unassigned reserves to 10 to 15% of our general fund expenditures any one year, like we used to do. Uh, up into 2019, and um, if there's if there's going to be the need for special budget expenditures uh, before quarter three, that we come forward now as part of the 2023 budget. So not to have SBOs that change our spending, unless somebody gives us a bunch of money to spend for something else, we'd be happy to do that one. So that's a summary of that. Uh, I think we have one public commenter, Justin Haller, wanted to speak. And then I'll open it up to council commentary. Here we are again. Good evening. Uh, I, my name's Justin Haller. I live in District 1 because District 2 was intolerable. Um, I'm wondering, with, with the aging fire trucks, why don't you put the aging fire trucks in your neighborhoods and see how long you can tolerate fire trucks breaking down in your neighborhoods and not being able to get to calls in your neighborhoods? I think that would be an awesome uh, way to go because as the fire chief said, this is a longstanding problem and unfortunately they tried things that didn't work and to, to try and save money and, and be a, a good steward with the money that they, they, they have, but unfortunately, you guys think that three hundred was it three hundred thousand dollars on rainbow colored sidewalks is the way to go? Like, huh? No, no, we don't need three hundred thousand dollars spent on rainbow sidewalks. Sorry, I don't care who you are, what you are, what you're affiliated with, what you identify as. Three hundred thousand dollars on sidewalks is a wa or crosswalks is a waste of resources. If you want rainbow colored sidewalks, throw that to the private sector, have them crowdfund it. All the people who want that can go fund it themselves. And then you can focus on things that matter for everyone versus a very, 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 very small percentage. You wouldn't make rainbow colored si or rainbow uh, crosswalks or some kind of crosswalk for the left-handed, red-headed Pisces with blue eyes because that would, wouldn't be inclusionary, right? So why would you have rainbow crosswalks, sidewalks, whatever, for a very small percentage of the people who, who it just, it's, it's baffling. Please, please, please be good stewards of the money that you already take from us and take all those decrepit old fire trucks and put them in your neighborhoods if you don't think that we need them. And then see how much you need them. Thank you. Any council commentary on the budget resolution? Councilmember Cathcart. 
Yeah, thank you. So again, as has been said a few times, we're in a pretty tough financial situation. Um, and my big concern and why I, I will be voting for this tonight um, and why I think it's really important that we um, uh, try to the best we can follow much of what's in here is the long term sustainability of our budget. You know, we've talked about the service agreement for Trent tonight. Um, all in, that is probably going to be around nine or $10 million when it comes back for renewal a year from now. We don't have necessarily identified exactly how we're going to pay for that. Um, we've kind of got some ideas, uh, but nothing's concrete, and it's all just kind of hanging out there at this point. We know we're going to have a lot more overtime next year because we've not yet been able to completely fix those issues, and, and we may never truly be able to, and so that's another big cost we have. And then there's um, the pending uh, recession, or maybe we're in the recession now. But either way, you know, I think there's going to be a coming economic hit that we're not yet quite feeling. And so we've got a plan for that. We need to have a resilient budget that is prepared for what may come, uh, especially because you know, there are certain priorities I certainly do not want to see us uh, have to cut in, in the coming year or, or years. Uh, so those are my big concerns and um, one amendment that we made this afternoon and and thanks for for supporting it uh, was one that I offered that just simply says, you know, um, identifying one of the things we've been told by the administration is that just in terms of trying to be thoughtful in identifying some of the, the cost reductions, they might need more time. And so one one thing that I included was just this request that as an alternative to the 10 percent you know, if they could come up with some specific initiatives uh, that could be worked on in the first half of next year and then uh, considered in a mid-year supplemental budget, that could be perhaps an alternative way to make sure that we're, we're getting on that sustainable path. I get government bureaucracies, things take a lot of time, a lot longer than I would like, um, but it is what it is. And so it was... An, uh, an attempt at a compromise, I think, to to find a, a path that we can all kind of work on together. So, um, again, I think it's really important that we come up with a plan to be sustainable in our budgeting uh, because it could have big implications a year, two, three years down the road if we don't. So that's why I'll be supporting this tonight. Any other commentary? Councilmember Burr. Bingle. Yeah, I understand the, the purpose of this resolution. I, I probably won't be supporting it tonight. Um, it's not that there's a ton in here that I disagree with. I think, you know, a longer term public safety capital financing plan is a great idea. Um, the, the big one that, that uh, there's, there's just a couple that, that jump out to me. Uh, you know, I don't understand city finances as well as our CFO, Tanya, Tanya Wallace does. Um, and speaking through uh, you know, the budget with her and, and the things that we're asking. There's a couple things in here that I just don't think we actually need or things that are going uh, farther than we, we, we should be going and they can actually send a bad message to the community. And so, uh, you know, the 10% the reduction that I know we did amend to have some different language on it um, is, is not really anything that we need to go that drastic. 10% is, is quite the cut um, and we don't need it to be um, that large. Uh, when it comes to our reserve balance, um, again, we seem to be um, in a good place uh, when we're when we're talking to um, our CFO that we're we're in in a range that she feels very comfortable with, um, and so for a number of reasons, I'm I'm probably not going to support this. That doesn't mean I disagree with everything in it because um, there are some uh, some good portions of it, but but overall, um, I do understand the purpose of it. Any other council commentary? Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you. I will be supporting this as good stewards of the money. There isn't enough to go around. And so this is not just setting this up for 2023, but we have to implement some practices going forward. The recession we're in or whatever you want to call it, uh, our revenues will not be what they have been. And this has been an extremely good year. So we're having struggles in a good year. Let's think about what a bad year may look like for our revenues. So as we go forward, 10% is aspirational. I would like to see it. I think many of us at our own dinner tables are looking at how we can start saving money 
and what we can do with that. What is the absolute essential for our households to survive? When we are making these decisions for the city, we have to think along those same lines. So as we go forward, yes, work with the administration. That's always a goal. We've been asking for their assistance and partnership uh, since July. Uh, that has not been as fruitful as we would have liked. But with clear direction, I hope that we will get there and we will have a budget that will be sustainable for 2023. All right, prepare to vote. All right, that passed six to one. That's our last legislative issues. We're at open forum. We have a few people signed up for open forum. Uh, just a reminder, if you want to speak at open forum, uh, I'll call people up and I'll list three people. So if you're the next couple of people, come on down and sit in the front row. Uh, you'll have up to three minutes. Um, there's a little light up here. It'll turn yellow when there's a minute left. And then um, when it hits red, your time's up, and I'll Sorry. ask you to go back to your seat. Uh, we, I ask that you address me as the meeting chair and um, that you don't um, say anything personally degrading about anyone up here or in the audience or, or frankly, anywhere else. Uh, there's no clapping or cheering. We did the clapping and cheering at the start of the meeting, but for this time of public comment, we don't do that. So it's a safe space, so no clapping, no booing. Um, the other thing is uh, the topics. You can talk about anything that's related to city business as long as it's not on uh, either tonight's agenda or ne the next meeting's agenda. So if, if I hear you veering off into another topic that's coming up, I'll ask you to go to talk about something else. That, the reason that is, is when we get to that, uh, either we had the chance today to testify or at our next meeting, you'll have a full opportunity to testify about that. And with that, the first person I have signed up is uh, Mrs. Michael Jones, and then Justin Bodajou, I think, and then Rick Bocook. And so, Mrs. Jones, you can come right, right up to that microphone there, and... Do your best to speak in. It goes up and down, so you can. I'm a recent widow. My husband uh, oh, sorry. lost his life January 27th, 21. Mm. At that time, his brother, John Earl Jones, came in, defrauded and defrauded my home. His attorney, Robert Rowley, went into a knit pleases courtroom, and at the end of stealing my home and stealing my statutory warranty deed, he started talking about the Jones Trust and that I was Michael's daughter and had no right to the Jones Trust. This is not true. Since then, I found out in this trust, the Guardian Foundation, Volunteers of America, and many, many federally funded programs, millions of dollars, this pedophile perpetrator has access to and is now operating in Spokane, Washington. He's at Motel 6 on Russell Road. I saw him chop chop in my husband's Mercedes. I want a full internal res investigation from lawful ethical people. I know what he's doing with this money. I know who he is and everything he's done. I applied for a job at the Davidson Corporation and they sent me back. This is pending my, my employment. It says that to contact the Financial Protection Bureau, Federal Trade Commission, the Office of Com Comptroller of the Currency Customer Assistance Group, the FDIC Consumer Response National Credit Administration, Assistant General Counsel for the Aviation Enforcement Proceedings, AZ Aviation Consumer Protection. These people have all sued me and have cases against me. I've never had a driver's license. I, I miss Daisy, I always got driven. The Federal Trade Commission, the Farm Credit Administration, the Securities and Exchange Commission. There's a lot of money in this foundation. Mm -hmm. I have sit, t went in front of a federal court. This little shysty attorney has come and knocked me out of court every step of the way. They financially crippled me. I'm in that homeless shelter over on Cannon. We went without water over there, hot water for four weeks. 
Four weeks, we don't get fed. He made me homeless. I've never been homeless. I'm Mrs. Jones, and I demand somebody stop this man, John Earl Jones, from perpetrating my trust any further. Thanks for coming down, Mrs. Jones. Um, Justin Bodit, I'm not going to get your name right. If you can introduce yourself and let me know. Also, let us know where you, if you live in the city or someplace else. Thank you, Council. Council President. Uh, my name is Justin Bodishu. I live in District 2, uh, but in the east central side of District 2 uh, mm -hmm. of that neighborhood. Uh, the reason why I'm speaking tonight is regarding dog parks. It's a very big issue in our neighborhood right now, and I actually live uh, right next to Underhill Park. So I want to share tonight some of the neighborhood uh, feelings that I've been a part of, as well as just sharing a little bit more about my personal story as uh, a member of the South Asian community that actually uses that park quite a bit. Uh, my wife and I have lived in the East Central part uh, of District 2 for about four years now. We are both dog owners. We have two rescues. And we've gone to the South Hill unofficial dog park hundreds of times with these two dogs. Yet we live next to Underhill Park. We've always seen a large regional park like the unofficial South Hill Park as the place to go. Uh, but the three uh, potential locations that the Parks uh, Department has uh, presented the community, uh, which is Hazel's Creek, uh, Lincoln Park, and Underhill Park, we believe that all three locations are just unsuitable for us as dog, uh, dog park users, but also as members of the Underhill Park community. Uh, so what we'd like to do is to invite you members uh, to come out to these three sites to just walk those sites yourself and see how unsuitable they actually are. 79% uh, of the survey, uh, dog park survey re respondents indicated that they want to preserve any of the existing natural areas of this town. In Underhill Park, it's the one truly natural area that the kids in our neighborhood can actually just walk around and enjoy without having resources to get to places like Riverside State Park or elsewhere. Um, we've heard from members of the South Asian community tonight. Uh, the only cricket team in town, the winning Spokane Spartans, uses Underhill Park extensively. And any change, uh, even though it's not affecting the cricket pitch itself, any change to the park would be detrimental to that community as well. So for the Marshallese neighbors that I've spoken to, to the cricket uh, players that I've spoken to, to the other dog walkers in our neighborhood, we just want to share that Underhill Park is really an unsuitable location. And we're encouraging our city council members to work at the Parks Department to find a more suitable option in District 2. So thank you. All right. Thanks for coming down. All right. And Rick Bocook and then not going to Nanda Gopal's after that and then Anton Vallone. So you all got computers, which means that you can look things up. So I'm briefly going to speak about the Tenth Amendment and what's happening at Camp Hope. <clears throat> Tenth Amendment relates to uh, the powers of the state. Now I know that um, this is like the governor. See, the governor has this power that presidents can't interfere with. He also has the power to put mandates out, call the National Guard. And when he does it, you know, you really can't do anything about it. So they have this little battle going over here at Camp Hope. Got the city and the county, you know, wanting to push their will. And all of a sudden the state writes a letter back to them and tells them basically they're exempt and that they're not going to be able to push their will upon the state. <clears throat> state has the power of the Tenth Amendment behind it. Just like when the governor put the mandate out, the power of the Tenth Amendment was there which means you couldn't do a damn thing about it. And it's the same thing now. Now, <clears throat> you're hearing about lack of resources here. There's just recently a lawsuit, you know, with the police. The police lost millions of dollars. They could do the same thing here with Camp Hope. You start enforcing your will without violating the Constitution. The police take an oath to hold, uphold the Constitution. The sheriff takes an oath. You all take an oath. The mayor takes an oath. You're supposed to defend the Constitution. So whenever you, make, whenever you look at these decisions or agree with a decision, like say with the sheriff or the police department or the mayor, you got to look at the part of, is it violating the Constitution? Because if it is violating the Constitution, and if people go enforce their will upon these people out here, there will be a lawsuit because there's attorneys out here, probably pro bono attorneys, waiting for it to happen, waiting for somebody like the sheriff or the police or the mayor to push their will, waiting for it. 
Because as soon as they can prove that the Constitution is violated by people that take the oath to uphold the Constitution, big money goes out. So while all this resources you're talking about, it's gonna go downhill. So people really need to, I know there's people that are on board with what I'm talking about, I know that. But I think that people should be really weighing this out and do what the state says, rescind that little order that they put out until to get homeless people taken care of. And this trench shelter, it's a nightmare. They don't have showers there, they don't have good facilities, and you're gonna put people there. And they're already putting people there right now. You can't sardine people together. I gave the example last time. Go stay at a place and listen to somebody cough and snore. Get right next to them and see how long you can endure it. I know you aren't gonna be able to endure it. It would drive you nuts. You would have to go to a psychologist or psychiatrist and get prescribed antidepressant medicine. Thank you. Thank you. And then to go, Paul, if you can introduce yourself so I'll be able to say your name next time. And after her is Antone Vallone and then Earl Moore. Is this good? Yeah. Okay. Um, namaste to all of you. Honorable Chairman Beggs and then all the other honorable council members. I know Mr. Bingle is smiling at me. He's a, a cat card. They both are our uh, council members. I've known Honorable Kieran Stratton for a long, long time. This is a thank you note, so I'll just take, I got two minutes, a second over, please excuse me. <laughs> My name is uh, Sri Dharani Nandagopal, and I taught at the community college for 27 years. My husband, Dr. Emma Nandagopal, worked for the city of Spokane for 38 years. As an engineer, he was a chief engineer for the Upriver Dam project, and now we both are retired. Our three children were born and brought up here, went to meet, meet school district complete. Now our oldest daughter moved back to seven, uh, seven years ago to Spokane saying that Spokane is near nature and near perfect, so we'll come back here. And we're trying to make it near culture. The last three years kind of put us back, kind of. So uh, she's now a founding member of the Elson Floyd Medical School. She has come and talked in front of you mm -hmm. to make the, oh, so she, yeah, yeah she, she remembers here. Um, uh, you know, like daughter, like mother. So we're very honored and pleased to have received grants from many organizations in Spokane, including City of Spokane f cultural grants. The recent one being just last month for the <clears throat> concert we had on last Saturday. I think you have that program in front of you. Do you have it? I, I gave it to the, yeah, I think it's there, the program in front of you with house full audience of about 200 people, and they all wanted to know why we make it free. I said, it's the city of Spokane has given us the grant. What else do you want? So we have brought many cultural programs from our motherland to our adopted land of Inland Northwest. For the past 35 to 40 years, we've been in Spokane for 47 years. We thank all of you, the honorable council members, and also the community organization and members in our efforts to educate the Spokane citizenry about our diverse cultures to bring rich cultures to Spokane. And, you know, and people are really looking forward to it. And yesterday they just stood up and just clapped like anything after the program. So thank you all very much and good night to all of you. Good to see you, thank you. Anton, after Anton is Earl Moore, and then Justin O'Connell. Uh, I'd just like to thank you guys. My, my name is Anton. Uh, I live in the uh, first district. Oh, yeah. move that mic up a little bit now. Oh, I live in the first district. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just, I just want to say that uh, since I've been coming to this meeting, you know, and I'm pretty pleased with that, what you guys are doing, making, you know, trying your best to work with, with the public. You know, and uh, I, if we could just all use our little morals, you know, you know, and just uh, even, you know, not just you guys, you know, yet if we do our share, if I do my share and not worry about think things in negative way, believe me, when you correct yourself, even your Bible says that. It, you're, 
when you improve your life, yourself, it, the outward falls in place. You know, I just want to say that, okay? And uh, I was going to read something, but I decided not to. But I do appreciate you guys. And thank you, okay? Yeah. Thank you, Anton. Yeah. All right, Earl Moore, and then Justin O'Connell, and Gretchen McDevitt. Hi, and <clears throat> thank you, council members, for, for all the time that you put in. And I know often we don't all agree, but we all love our city. I love that. But I just, I wonder, why do you go through a process of engaging the community on issues, and yet when a supermajority support the position, it's like you, you don't agree, and you, you won't vote with the majority. I think sometimes that you, 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 you bypass months of work and effort that is put on of volunteers to reach out an outcome that you wanted, not what we wanted. And it, I don't think you always represent the voice of the people or even the voice of your own districts. You only sometimes represent what you think and your own, I don't know if they're your interests, but it's very disappointing to me. I think you've shown a pattern of operating that way over and over again as long as I've been attending these meetings. And it, it's different. It's, it's different. It has to do with the East Central neighborhood community. It had to do with the fluoride and the drinking water. And I just, I, I, I see a pattern that's very disappointing. I, I just want to share that. I, I know you all work very hard. And the main thing I want to do too tonight though is as I have said all of this to you, also I see positive things, lots of positive things. And the thing from my district, for Councilwoman Stratton, I want to thank you for listening and voting with the majority. And I appreciate that when you did that. Thank you. Thank you, Earl. Uh, Justin O'Connell, and then Gretchen McDevitt, and then Sherry Barnett. Good evening, Council President, Council. Last week was National Indigenous Day. We have that off at Central Planning, so please, in the future, feel free to take that day off. Now, we're here, we've had an issue, I've brought this up before, Houston, Texas, Central Planning has a list of demands of all of you. Now, this is a list of demands of things not to do. Don't do anything Texas does. Everything is bigger in Texas, including apparently the effort to house the homeless. They use HUD funds. Houston took a housing first approach. Homeless for a year, you get an apartment in 30 days. Veteran and homeless, apartment in 30 days. The best part is you can still do drugs. Now, this helps attract more homeless people to the apartments, but Houston takes care, worries about that later. Houston's quote, permanent housing support, permanent supportive housing strategy is a thorn in central planning's side. It means that the chronically homeless receive housing, money for rent, utilities, bus fare, other necessities, and are assigned even a case manager. Now, every homeless person gets a vulnerability score. At Central Planning, we know everyone's actually uh, quite vulnerable right now, especially uh, with the coming, uh, we'll just call it a recession. Now, chronically homeless get out of housing in 30 days. This approach has led to a more than 80% success rate. People are remaining housed. 100 organizations came together, the city, nonprofits, corporations, they had a software to streamline their efforts. They put a nonprofit, not a city bureaucracy in the driver's seat. Please definitely do not do that. Central planning is a taking a bureaucracy first approach. Uh, we want the whole planet to ultimately be one big bureaucracy. Now Houston worked with landlords, that's also horrible. Central planning uh, per, uh, uh, prefers the squatter first approach. So we arm the homeless with pit bulls and when the homeowners walk outside their house the homeless run in real quick and we lock the door behind them and then it's the courts issue now whatever you do please don't offer landlords for instance financial incentives to house the formerly homeless punish them for not housing the homeless now Houston's discovered their quote permitive supportive housing strategy is cheaper than just jailing the homeless which is the old-fashioned way central planning wants everyone in jail and if you're not in jail then we just want you to pay higher taxes now we have to get creative on how not to fund any of this stuff because houston uses the hud funds so we need those funds to disappear somehow do we know a homeless shelter operator that can make funds disappear 
We just give them the HUD funds. Now, you yourselves have taken steps which worry us greatly at central planning. For instance, you banned local income taxes. Also, you deregulated accessory dwelling units. Those are structures that serve as additional living units on a property with its own facilities. We're watching you. It's like that song, you know? I always feel like somebody's watching me and I have no privacy. I always feel like somebody's watching me. Tell me it's just a dream. Have a good evening. Thanks, Justin. Gretchen McDevitt and then Sherry Barnett and then Kevin Strodinger or Stodinger. Gretchen McDevitt, Council District 2. <clears throat> I, I'm s saying somewhat what Earl said, and this came about because I saw a post on Next Door Neighbor, and it really concerned me. It's a specific post, so I'll make it general because it involves partially a topic that's coming up in the future. So the post said something to this effect. Brian Beggs expressed his displeasure concerning the recent survey and recommendation by a city committee and um, suggested a petition to take the former proposal back to the drawing board. Council members Zach Sapone and Betsy Wilkerson shared uh, at our last uh, West Hills community, neighborhood community meeting that the outcome wasn't the desired outcome. I don't know how accurate this is because it came from a citizen, but it concerned me because it made it sound like that whatever the people want, we'll just keep trying until we get what we want. And so I hope that when we talk to you and share our concerns, that you listen, and even if you don't agree, that if it's a majority of the people, then you will take that into account. And so, and then uh, and an additional thing, I mentioned this at a previous meeting of a committee. <laughs> and um, when it, the issue is really somewhat divisive, I guess I'll say, and you appoint a committee, I hope that a conservative as well as a liberal or a progressive, excuse me, a conservative and a progressive can be part of the committee rather than two progressives on issues that are probably somewhat concerning for the public and where we might be divided, because it's important to get both sides of the issue, or all sides of the issue. There's more than just two sides. Thank you very much, and I know what you do is overwhelming, and I appreciate all your work. I know it's a full-time job, so thank you very much. Thanks, Gretchen, for coming down. Sherry? Barnett, after Sherry, Kevin Stoddinger, and then William Healings. President Bates and all members of the City Council, Sherry Barnett, and I live in Spokane. And this is kind of a, off the wall, I haven't heard you talk about it before anyway, but I'm looking at current events and I'm thinking that Spokane is in a strategic place, the water, the population, the military, and I think they should put together a civil defense group to analyze and make plans for communication and for, I know they had some old tunnels that I, it seems like when Ben Stucker was here, they filled up some of them due to safety issues, but I just think maybe get some military people, get some people, uh, that have to do with fire and um, engineering here in this area and put some plans together so that people will begin to think if war should come, how are we going to handle this? And then I have a little more time. So I, I wanted to, this is a little protest about the voting system because when I was a kid, you know, my mom was always on the election board, and um, I didn't know until I was an adult exactly how it worked, but the way they had it usually was in a school or a church, and it was a neighborhood thing. And they would have a big table, and they'd have all the voters, the Democrats, and the 
Republicans, at the same table. The people would come in, they would identify themselves with their driver's license the, and their address, and they would scratch them off, and their particular party people would hand them a ballot, and the other party was there as an observatory. Now, they just had that day. You could save an awful lot of money, and you would have everyone feel a great deal more secure in election by going back to that old system. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Kevin, come on up and introduce yourself, and then William Hewlings, and then Justin Haller. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, my name is Kevin Stanger. I'm here. I'm a guest and a client at the Way Out Shelter Salvation Army. Um, I've been uh, Spokane Knight since 1976. At one point, I had two homes here in Spokane, Lake Home, up in Pontiac County. Through poor choices of addiction and mental health problems, I became homeless. I've been homeless for eight years. And when I first went to the Way Out Shelter, they only had cots. They didn't even have an indoor bathroom. Now, the place has been remodeled. We have a beautiful facility. But that's not why I'm, I'm here to talk about it. I'm here to talk about the model that Jerry Ann, Michelle, and the staff has made of the program. It's individualized, case-by-case -case basis. Now, I have SSI, but I've only been there a month and a half, and they've got me a place. I'm moving in Thursday. The other miracle part of this, through um, my addiction recovery, I've had three excellent job offers. I'm going to be able to get off of disability welfare rules. I don't know what they're asking for budget, but I was going to end my life, and I'm telling you, these people have saved it. And nobody asked me to come and talk. I just wanted to give my two cents and tell you what a beautiful program it is. And when Salvation Army says they're doing the most good with what they get, they really do. And I'm just so thankful for their program and your time. And that's pretty much all I got, unless you have any questions for me. No. Thank, <laughs> Kevin, thank you so okay. much. No, for thank you down. so much. I and appreciate really, you. Good luck in your new thank place. You. Thank you for sharing. William. And then Justin, and then Cassandra. Good evening. Uh, my name is William, and I live downtown Spokane. Um, due to COVID, for about two years, we didn't have city, Spokane City Council meetings. And so I'm going to bring up some old, some old, uh, some old news, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. But this has been uh, bothering me because I've been coming back to city council and I look up here and I look at you. And so I'm going to read this. This is uh, Judge Patrick Johnson. And I've read this before to you guys. Some of these people weren't city council members at the time. The court has weighed the free speech rights of the respondent and ultimately finds that the conduct described broadly falls within the limits of protected political speech. The court takes note that most of the conduct described takes place at City Hall or outside City Hall, and also at locations in which groups with opposing political views gather. This distinction is crucial in the court's analysis of time, place, and manner when determining what level of protection to assign to the respondent's free speech rights. Comments at City Hall merit the highest level of scrutiny. On November 12th, 2019, that's pretty much when I first started coming to these meetings, the court denied a related petition for a temporary order and denied the order due to concerns that an order would have a chilling effect on free speech. Now, I'm not going to read no more, but the reason why I'm mentioning this is because there's emails, and I didn't get to talk about this, from Brianne Beggs. Kim, obviously very disturbing. <coughs> I am so sorry that you had to experience that in city council chambers. But basically, it goes on and you end, let me know how I can help you. Lori Kinnear, 
I have contacted Chief Meidel. So you guys are helping people. And just so you know, nothing came of that. It was obviously denied and they lost their little case. But now this person that took me to court might get a big city position. And I'm just, I, I don't understand it. But I don't have much more time, but I will be talking more about this when I have more time. So probably next Monday. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hewling. And then Justin Haller, and after Justin, Cassandra. I'm Justin Haller. I live in District 1 because nobody gave a flying fig about the crime in District 2, nor did they care to act on it. It was uh, pretty despicable. They told me to call the police. The police told me to call Big Charity. P big Charity told me to call the police. It was one big circle thing. Um, how is it that someone can be under an ethics violation who is a lawyer? That seems kind of weird. You would think that someone who is a lawyer, <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> um, lawyers really historically don't have ethics. But uh, someone who is a lawyer, you would think would know better the difference between an edict and a law. But somebody else did. It's pretty amazing. Um, I just, I, I, I don't get that. And, you, you know, like, like someone else said, you should be above reproach. You know, you're under scrutiny by all of us taxpayers, by all of us people who vote you in or out. It's very frustrating. Um, a, as is a mural that is known to be perpetrated by, by, by the organization was started by people who are grifting money and Candace Owens and Kanye West have exposed that to no end and to no avail. And it, it just, it's just, it's interesting how we have a big mural that says 2.6% of the population matter. Never mind the other percentages. And especially when it's uh, known to be a grift and they steal a bunch of money from this organization and they buy houses in Topanga Canyon, which is really, you know, it's. I wouldn't want to live there. It's a bunch of hippies and you smell patchouli all the time. But the thing is, you have a known grifting organization that you're basically just slapping everybody in the face with by having that mural up still. Um, and then you have two other council members who are um, investigating some possible fraud with the homeless situation. Now, if you had less money in the homeless situation, you would have less potential fraud. But because you have so much money in the homeless complex, you have so much possibility for fraud there, which is despicable and deplorable. You allowed people to camp here at city council, and then that organization who buys beer in cases for who knows what purpose, they're, they're, they're stealing money, and then you have uh, possible uh, members stealing money and under investigation for fraud. It just, there's so much money in that, it, it, it really is hard to discern how you're going to help people when everyone's got their hand out and everyone wants a kickback, everyone wants a little bit for themselves. You know, it's, 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 it's pretty disgusting. Um, again, with the, with the fire trucks, put them in your neighborhoods, put them in, in uh, where, where you don't want them. Thanks, Justin. And, and one more thing. What, what, what's going on with the arson? How many cars need to blow up? There's several. Look at the news. Cassandra, welcome to City Council. Hey, I'm Cassandra Moffitt, and I'm here. Just I want to thank you guys. You know, your guys help to be able to get off homelessness. I stay at the Way Out Shelter. I've been there two and a half months. Coming off 21 years of meth. Lost all five of my kids. I was homeless for 11 and a half years. And I <laughs> amazingly turned myself into jail. Currently off papers for the first time ever in my life. <laughs> Super excited about that. But I just got into a place at a lift house, which is living in faith together. And then I got a job as, at Pioneer as a residential treatment uh, specialist. And I never in my life thought I could do this. The Way Out Shelter is the ones who help, man. And so the funding you guys are doing for homelessness and trying to get everybody permanent housing is a great thing, dude. Like, I don't know what I'd do without it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you, guys. <laughs> Thanks for coming down, Sharon. Appreciate it. All right. 
that brings us to the end of our meeting tonight. So everyone, we'll see you back next week. Everyone, please take care. And if you can't take care of someone else, we're adjourned. <laughs>